So today's topic is Iowa State's data set disclosure process. Um, and sh we have multiple guest speakers here today. My name is Megan O'Donnell. I'm the data services librarian at Iowa State University Library. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, we have four guest speakers today. I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in more detail later, but we have Sarah Katz from the Office of Research Ethics, Brooke Lenks from the Office of Research Ethics, Craig Forney from the Office of Innovation Commercialization, and Beth Pieper from Ames Laboratory. And if I mispronounced any of your names, I apologize. Please correct me when you introduce yourselves in a few moments. Okay. So today we're just going to do a brief history and overview of what this process is. And then the most, the majority of today's meeting will be an open panel Q&A and discussion. Um, I have questions to ask the panel, but you are invited to ask your own and you can do that by typing in the chat or unmuting yourself once we get to that portion. So what is the data set disclosure process? It is a review process to ensure that the research data shared on the Iowa State University repository doesn't contain valuable intellectual property, violate contracts, policy law, or ethics. We had multiple partners during the development of this process. Um, Ames Laboratory was brought in after the process was developed, but has been since worked into the workflow. I believe we had some partners um, in the very beginning that exceeded this list, but these are the main stakeholders that now are in possession of the, or developed and are stakeholders in the process. And so Office of Innovation Commercialization, which handles intellectual property, the Office of Research Ethics, which handles um, policy, compliance, and ethics, Ames Laboratory, which is a federally funded U.S. Department of Energy lab on the Iowa State campus and has some processes that are separate from the rest of the university, and then the university library, which is where I work and I help um, oversee and maintain this process. So how this process came about um, is a little unusual. Our prior vice president of research really was an advocate of open science and wanted to find a way for Iowa State to support and promote sharing of open research data, but in a very safe way that acknowledged and respected all the university's obligations, including compliance with law and policy, security, um, ethics and protection of research subjects, intellectual property, and more. And we knew this was a big challenge and there really wasn't a lot of literature that or um, examples from other universities that pointed the way on how to do this. So this is a very much a homegrown process. What we ended up building is a workflow that screens and tracks data sets and the research funding and the PIs who do the research. And this was done through a lot of talking and listening and meetings, um, development of an application, and then doing follow-up and check-ins throughout the process. And we've been doing this for about, I think we're about to hit four years soon. So it did take some time for us to streamline it. I think it took two and a half years for it to get to the current state that it's in. And during this time, um, I actually think we built a lot of collaboration and trust between these partners as well. And I know I learned a lot um, about how, what each office does, what their concerns are, and how uh, this, process, this workflow and process ties into their own work. So to give you an overview of what the workflow looks like, uh, first, someone has to submit the disclosure and depending on what is filled out in that disclosure, um, it can trigger multiple reviews. And so this is a very simple diagram that um, does not include Ames Laboratory. And that is partially because uh, it would not have fit on the slide if I had done that. Um, and, but we can go into more detail about how that breaks out later. 
Uh, but basically, the Office of Research Ethics is responsible for things such as live animal screening, biohazards, human subjects, and export control, and class classified, I think I may have put that in correctly, I think it's um, unclassified controlled information. Um, well, the Office of Intellectual Property and Tech Transfer, which is now called the Office of Commercialization Innovation, so I need to update that figure looks at software and database licensing patents and other IP concerns in the research data that is planning to be shared. Once uh, the other partners approve the data set for sharing, it comes to the library, and this is when we actually start screening files, and we look for things um, such as individual variables, as well as things that are part more of the traditional curation process, such as documentation, file formats, organization and things like that. So the way this whole process gets triggered is through the submission of a form. And I'm going to visit that. Can you guys see my web page? I want to make sure it's sharing the right screen. All right, thank you. So this form is dynamic and it has been updated a few times because we had to work through some data control, data quality control issues where people were maybe not entering what we expected them to. And so this first question um, is something where if you're not the PI because we found out a lot of grad students submit, you would say no. And then it would ask for your information as well as the PI's information, because we need to track the primary investigator because that's usually where the research funding grants and other uh, documentation is filed under, and the graduate student's name will not bring that up. Uh, we do ask for just fairly basic information about the data set, and we ask them to choose a license here to um, speed up the process so that they know what their options are when they actually go to share. And then we have a set of screening questions, um, including four about sensitive subjects. So there's some very um, low hanging fruit, such as PII and personal information that can lead to the identification of human subjects. But then we also added in things such as perspective protected species and locations because we out here at Iowa State work with a lot of land-based research. So we might be working with farmers on, with private land and the farmer's names and the names of their property should not be included in the data set. So even though, and these things kind of fall out of some of the other types of protocols. So we added another type of question to be able to catch that kind of stuff. Same thing for confidential and proprietary data, uh, because we do not want this kind of stuff shared openly in our repository. The other big section involves uh, sponsorship. So there's a separate section for Ames Lab. And if you had federal or other types of funding, we also ask you to identify it and provide um, the name of it, the name of the funding source, as well as the account number, so we can that can be tracked and looked up. And lastly, we have a research assurance section, which really looks into compliance of different uh, legal and ethical policies um, that have to be followed for the university to stay in compliance. And depending on the answers to all of these go back to my slides. Sorry about this. That, so depending on how those are answered, that is what controls what is triggered and which office reviews things in the uh, disclosure workflow. So one of the reasons this is successful is that we use tracking and notifications in this workflow, and we use an application called Smartsheet. 
And this is used to collect the data through a form and then through automation, we're able to notify um, folks to do reviews through emails and also track decisions. Um, it did take us about two years to streamline this and I still run into bugs occasionally. I just fixed one, I think last month that had been bugging me for a couple of years because I wasn't sure how to fix it in Smartsheet. Uh, automation has really helped dramatically with streamlining this process because we're able to all see where we are at the same time instead of um, having to manually follow up with folks or um, through by email or phone calls to figure out if a decision has been made. And that is a very brief overview of the process and I know I went through that a bit quickly. So, but the focus of today is on the Q&A with our panelists. So let's move into that. Um, so today's guest, Sarah, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi everyone. My name is Sarah Katz and I am the director of the Office of Research Ethics. We are one of the units that reports to the Vice President for Research. Our office is the administrative home for all of the research compliance committees. And we also are responsible for the program areas of conflicts of interest and commitment, export control, unmanned or uncrewed aircraft. These would be the dr drones that are flown for research purposes. And our office is also home to the research integrity officer. While she direct reports directly to the vice president for research, she is uh, a part of our office and we claim her as one of our uh, team members here in the Office of Research Ethics. I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. Thank you, Sarah. Brooke, uh, please introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Brooke Langlitz and I'm the Associate Director in the Office of Research Ethics and Sarah explained what our office does and I'm uh, here to talk about our export control review process and controlled unclassified information. Great. Craig, um, at the Office of Innovation and Commercial Legislation, you're up. Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is Craig Forney. I'm the Assistant Director here in the Office of Innovation and Commercialization. Um, I run the uh, commercialization group, so we um, work on protection and licensing of uh, intellectual property, broadly spoken. Uh, most of our work is in technology licensing, uh, but we also work with germplasm and then data sets. Um, so, thanks. All right, Beth. Uh, my name is Beth Pieper. I work at Ames Laboratory um, in our innovation um, project. Oh my goodness, I forgot our department name because I'm not good <laughs> at speaking in front of people. <laughs> No worries. Innovations Partnership Program. We, uh, I work closely with Craig because IP runs out of our office. We do proposals, contracting, um, publication tracking uh, for the laboratory as a whole. Um, Ames Laboratory is one of 17 of the Department of Energy Laboratories. Great. Thank you all. And I hope I didn't mischaracterization, mischaracterize your work too badly earlier. Okay, so um, my first question for all the panelists was, ha, what was the most surprising part of this collaboration? And I know some of you have been part of the process since the beginning, which included kind of the negotiation process to create the form. And some of us have come in later, including myself. I'll, I'll start with that one. <laughs> um, I think probably the most surprising thing to me has been how well this has all worked. To be completely frank, we've got a lot of people that are involved in this process and thinking through how on earth is all of this going to work and how are all of these reviews going to work. Working with Megan and streamlining this process through Smartsheet, it has been really slick. The process has worked really well, and I've honestly been very surprised at how well it has all come together. Uh, I can add on the library side, I am also been pleasantly surprised by how well this has worked because when it was first introduced to me, I was thinking, oh, this is just another hoop for researchers to jump through and they're not going to want to do it. And We've had the opposite reception for the most part. There have been a few folks who have been resistant, but um, I think that was 
mostly early on when we were still working out the bugs in the system. Yeah, I think from our perspective, um, you know, it has, has worked pretty well. Um, I think the biggest challenge for us was trying to integrate it into our workflows. So uh, within our office, we work in a docketing system. And so the data comes in off a of Smartsheet and then it still goes into the docketing system. And then case managers and commercialization managers will pick up the, 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 the case and review it. And we try to do it in a fairly time, uh, timely fashion. Uh, but you know that's that whole integration has been part of the the, the challenge and um, and success so of it. Okay, so similar question, but what was your biggest concern as we like going into this project? And so I kind of voiced mine, which was that I thought researchers would be put off by the process because they have to fill out kind of a long form. Um, but I know that was kind of on the library side where we're like on the user end and you folks are more on the compliance and screening and a whole different set of concerns. So what were your largest concerns when we started the process? I think we had the opposite concern, which would be that this would be just something that would grow exponentially over year on year and that it would become burdensome from a screening perspective. Um, you know, I think from what I recall, we look at the numbers weekly of the various types of cases that we're screening or, or reviewing, and it's kind of settled into a, a fairly consistent number year on year. Um, but that was our biggest fear was now we have this one other thing that we're supposed to do or that we that we get to do, and uh, and and it could overwhelm what our our capabilities or what, how we're resourced. So that's been a, a pleasant surprise, but our, probably our biggest fear. Okay, so scale was a fear. Sarah, I I'm think gonna one call, of, I was gonna say, I'm gonna oh, call I, on you. I actually have a comment. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I, um, one of my concerns was how long it would take for review, um, but it really hasn't been an issue and researchers haven't brought it up either. So we've been happy with that. I was going to say, Sarah, I'm going to call on you because I know you and I had a lot of conversations about yes. uh, <laughs> research subject safety. <laughs> yes. So it was a concern going into it. And honestly, it remains a concern still to this day. And that is that something would be shared that should not have been. And so making sure that, I mean, we're very, very careful in how we review these requests but there's always that underlying fear of is something is there something in this data set that I might not know about or have not been notified of by the PI that should have prohibited the sharing of this data um, that I just didn't know about in my review of it. Um, so that that I think is has been a concern and remains a concern that there might be something that's that's shared that should not have been. The good side of our process, though, and the thing that Megan and I have talked about a fair amount is how localized our control is. So the ability that Megan has to pull down a data set if something were ever found or if there was a problem in a data set, that local control is really nice to have and something I'm grateful for. Uh, Brooke, any uh, concerns on your end? I just want to echo what uh, Sarah said. Um, with in my world, the unauthorized disclosures could be um, very damaging for both the institution and the investigator. So um, that unauthorized disclosure is, is very big into in my world, and then also. Um, I didn't know, it, it, in the beginning, I really didn't know how this um, workflow would work. And I was really worried about the efficiency, at, you know, timeline, like Beth mentioned, and, and how we would get it all taken care of. But that is not a problem at all. It's been wonderful. Yeah, and I have to shout out to one of my coworkers, Jesse Garrison, who helped me 
create a formula in Smartsheet to automate some of this because um, I was able to do quite a bit of it on my own, but the final formula to like <laughs> do the final output was more complicated than I could figure out on my own. And so that it really does, it really did take quite a few different um, individuals and offices to get this off the ground and a lot of um, input to refine it. And it's, and so that brings me to my next question, which is, is there anything you'd like to see improved? I would say for me, I can't think of anything at this point in time, simply because when there has been an issue or there's been, it seems like maybe we could ask a question a different way, or maybe we should add a question to capture the location or, you know, if there's any sensitive species, you know, we're able to have those conversations with each other and we're able to kind of change it as we go, right? And so there's always kind of been this continuous improvement along the way that has has really been um, nice to see. And, and working with Megan has been wonderful in that it's it's real easy to say, hey, Megan, can we think about, let's let's talk about this, or is there a way to make this better? And so I feel like we've really been improving it along the way such that there's not really one thing at this moment in time anyway that stands out to me as something that I would like to change. And I'll just say you all have been really good at communicating to me because I'm the one who owns the smart sheet. And so I'm in charge of like configuring it. And you guys have all been very good at telling me like when something isn't working or needs improvement. And so there have also been like some just very small behind the scenes changes to just make each group's workflow work better. And so, and that couldn't have helped happen without your help and input. So, all right. Um, if there are no other uh, thoughts about improvement, I'm going to start delving into some more sticky questions. Um, by the reminder to all of our attendees that if you would like to ask a question, please unmute yourself or enter it in the chat and I'll ask it on your behalf. Okay, so Beth, over at Ames Laboratory, because I think it's a rather unique situation. I'd like to ask you how Ames Lab benefits from participating in this process. For us, it helps us meet the um, DOE public access order. Um, so whenever a data set is submitted, I do need to submit it to the Office of Scientific and Technical Information. Um, and then they repost it to OSTI.gov. So you, you can not only find it uh, through DataShare, but on OSTI.gov. So it helps in that way. And if I remember correctly, we also have to do export control checks through directly through Ames Lab too. Yes, yep. Okay. So that's, I don't know how many other universities will have similar situations, but as reporting becomes more important, I'm gonna expect we might actually end up getting more people interested in this kind of situation. I, I do know that the other labs, which I think is your next question, um, they do have similar processes in place. I have not actually seen any of them. Um, there's the monthly data services call um, that I know, Megan, you've attended once or twice. Um, and the one meeting they went into that, but nobody specifically said exactly what they did, but I know there are similar processes in place. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Craig, I have one for you, which is what are you primarily looking for when a data set disclosure comes to the Office of Commercialization Innovation? Yes. Yeah, so innovation, commercialization, I swapped it, didn't I? You did, but that's okay. We're, we're pretty flexible over here. Um, so, you know, we're really looking for a couple different things. Um, so uh, we're looking for, um, is this a data set that is going to impact our ability to, to file or prosecute a patent application that we're in, in the process of or, or considering? Um, it, you know, is it data that we should you know, take into consideration for that? Uh, but mostly we're looking for what opportunities there might be for the data to be used in a commercial setting. And we obviously, we want to make it available to non-commercial um, you know, research institutions, you know, we fully support that as a, as a priority for the institution. 
but we're, we're looking for, are, are there, is the, is the, could the data be used in a commercial, for commercial purposes as well? Um, you know, I, I've been interested to hear what Sarah has been saying as well as, as Brooke, you know, with respect to personally identifiable information. That's one of the things that we don't worry about from uh, our perspective as much because we don't have a medical school here. I know, you know, our sister institutions across the world, across the country that have medical schools have uh, a robust, many have a robust um, program for licensing data sets that come out of medical research. And that is a huge issue for them is, you know, the personally identifiable information. For us, um, most of our data set licensing has come in, that comes with agronomic data. And so we really don't, you know, we, we expect that uh, you identify whether it's corn or soybeans. Uh, that's <laughs> being reported on. So we don't worry about that in the same way that many of our sister institutions might have to do. But we're looking for commercial opportunities and, and how might that data be used? You know, what, what would be the ap application for that? Uh, many of our uh, researchers will, will create models. Uh, if, if you think along the lines of the interface between agronomic data and climate data, and they'll develop their own models. Uh, but really, in the back in the spirit of what uh, Sarah Nusser was looking at is to take that same data and allow other people to input it into their models or refine their models or create new models. And that that extends to commercial uh, institutions who want to do that same sort of work. So that's what we're primarily looking for. So as a follow up question, um, what. What is the Innovate, Office of Innovation Commercialization's prior experience with licensing data sets to commercial entities? Yeah, so we, we've licensed a few data sets. It, again, it's almost exclusively around agronomic data. So, you know, our researchers are out there and, you know, they have the ability to collect data from a variety of sources, both um, on our own university farms, um, as well as with private farmers who might be participating and, and sharing that data. Um, and then in, again, in conjunction a lot with climate data or some other types of uh, field traits or disease data or different things along those lines and how those interact with or interface with that agronomic data, that's where we have been able to successfully license to, to third parties. And if I remember correctly, we've only had one disclosure that had a potential for this, and I don't believe it. There was a follow through, but I don't remember. Do you remember that? You know, yeah, there has been. I, I you know, there have been a couple of data sets where we've been uh, followed up with the researchers to kind of get a better understanding. You know, the the form that they fill out that you showed, you know, it is is somewhat brief, um, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really drive particularly deep into the data. So there have been times when we've done follow-up with the researchers to, to get a better understanding of what the data really entails. Um, but uh, from the data set disclosure process, uh, we haven't licensed any of those data sets that have been disclosed through this process. Um, the, the ones that we've had success with were disclosed to our office independently of this, so. All right, uh, Brooke. I have a question for you. Um, so you work with a lot of security-based concerns and what, what are the security concerns for sponsored research agreements that limit the ability to share data that are the most common and that um, I guess are of the most concern? Sure, so what, what I'm really concerned about are um, contracts or awards that include uh, terms requiring that you comply with controlled unclassified information provisions or IP or IT security. Um, I'm worried about uh, certain export control terms, where if they say that something is controlled, or if they there is. Um, a restriction on who can work on it by nationality, um, because that also um, eliminates a fundamental research exclusion on which um, Iowa State and then all other you know 
uh, institutions of higher education rely. Um, additionally, publication restrictions. If a sponsor needs to approve a publication, um, that's what uh, that's something else that would negate our fundamental research exclusion and um, make that subject to export compliant. No, export. So um, to clarify, does this happen more often when uh, researchers are using data from a third party or when they're generating data for a third party? The, the biggest thing is when, when, we, when we deal with the fundamental research exclusion, if we don't have any of those limitations, um, then the results of research are free from export control regulation. However, any third party data that goes into that research is not, um, fundam not eligible for the fundamental research exclusion. So we have to look at those third party data sets individually, um, separately from the project. But in, in the security terms, um, mostly what we're looking at are, um, we're mostly looking at receipt of uh, third party data that is already controlled rather than creating additional controlled information. Okay, and I think that leads into um, data use agreements. And Sarah, I believe that's your domain. Um, and how do, you, how would that affect data sharing and like, and especially the disclosure process? So where we would see that would be if it was part of an IRB application or a human subjects research application. So if there is an indication that they receive data from a third party, we would want to make sure that we look at that agreement such that there would not be language in there that says you cannot share this data. If there is that language in there, then that's a very clear no, this is not going to be able to be shared through data share. So that's where we, our office would look at the um, data use agreements in terms of the human subject research is making sure that there, there's, um, there, there are or are not <laughs> data sharing limitations there. And, and that's, that's where we would be looking at that. Yeah, and then when it comes to the library, we also s double check where people are getting their data and make sure that they're citing it and that there's not usage uh, limitations on it because even though stuff is public, sometimes you're not allowed to redistribute it or do other things. And so we have to go, we go through and we check that on the library end. Um, but the, when it, by the time it gets to us, it's not controlled. Um, so that means it would have already have passed those check gates in the disclosure process. Um, and so, and that's been a learning process because we have found some older data sets don't have clear licensing. And in that case, we're like, okay, well, I guess we're gonna cite it and we're gonna put a link to it and we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so far, nothing's happened. Um, so Sarah, picking up on IRB type stuff, and I know we've changed our default language at Iowa State, but what happens when participants in a study are told their data is not going to be shared or will only be shared with the research team, and then the researchers have a output that they want to publish and have data that they also want to share? Yep. So what we would say there, very simply, is you can't share that data. And the reason for that is that that informed consent document and the informed consent process that those participants went through with you to volunteer to be a part of your study, they were told at that point and agreed to in signing that informed consent document that the information they provided to you would not be shared. And so that process is really the cornerstone of ethical human subject research and needs to be honored. And so if there is language in an informed consent document such that your participants have been told that you would not share their data, you cannot share their data. And I know you and I have talked about this because like what is their data? Because is it an aggregate? 
is that still human subject data and versus like by row by row it gets really sticky and there's not really clear guidance in some of those so that's i think one of the areas we're navigating here at iowa state along with everyone else right and just to to add on to that a little bit it is it is a gray area, but also the way that we think about it in the human subjects world is those data points would not exist if there were not human subjects involved in your study. And they are representative of people. Mm -hmm. And so making sure, again, going back to that informed consent document and making sure we honor what participants were told is really where we start in our review process of, of can a data set be shared. All right. Yeah, and that's one of making sure we honor protection of research subjects is definitely something oh, to balance with the data sharing mandates. Um, and NIH has a new one that rolls out next year. And as Craig mentioned, a lot of our friends with uh, research hospitals and med schools are a little concerned about that. It's not as big of a concern at Iowa State, but we do have some research that will be affected by it. Well, and the other thing I will just add to Megan for our audience is that throughout the, the IRB review process, so when a researcher submits an application for review by the IRB, one of the areas in our questionnaire that we ask about is data sharing. And there are requirements that in the informed consent document and in the informed consent process that participants are told whether or not their data will be shared. And so we're already putting that in front of researchers and having them think about what's going to happen with this data. What am I going to tell my participants so that we have that information captured and that they're thinking about it at, at kind of at the onset of their research process as well about making sure that data sharing and thinking about how what's going to happen to this data when I'm you know, done with the study and ready to start publishing and sharing this information, do I have the right approvals in place so that I am able to share this data and am able to comply with some of the requirements of the funding agencies? Yeah, and if I remember correctly, we actually had, when we first started, a couple of data sets that were signed under older IRB guidance where the, they didn't ask those questions. And so there was no room for sharing in the protocol. And so, yeah, that big, that was a big update to start including that in the IRB uh, protocols and questions. Um, so I have a question for Craig again, but I think it actually applies to everyone, which is under what conditions and in maybe in what part of the process should you disclose your data set to the Office of Innovation Commercialization before publishing? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, we'd like to have, we'd like to have those uh, conversations before you get to the point of of, of disclosure um, to to really understand what the data is and and have a, a good idea of how it can be used. Um, so, uh, again, kind of in those general areas that we find that there are commercial opportunities, we we love to have that conversation early. Um, you know, what, what data is being collected well before you publish it, well before you're writing your, your, um, your, 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 your manuscripts or, or um, uh, other associated scholarly work um, to just get an idea of, of where that is in the process. Um, you know, the, the majority of, of data sets that have come through don't really have that much for commercial application. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it, it's not something that you know, the majority of researchers would have to worry about, but you know, particularly in those, again, those areas of agronomic data, climate data, um, things that have uh, a more commercial potential, we like to have that conversation just up front to, to look at what's, what's the data like, should it be disclosed to us first um, beforehand? Or should it be something that can go through the normal process and we'll catch it on the, uh, on the as it goes through? So, and Beth, I'm guessing because Ames Lab works so closely with Craig's office, um, that might be a bit more of an integrated process at Ames Lab. Is that true? I, I mean, we, like Craig said, we like to get it as soon as possible. So yeah, we work really closely when we know that one is coming through. There've been a couple that I've tied um, and we've been able to get it, what we needed done to get it posted. 
All right. And then um, for Brooke and Sarah, I know Sarah mentioned it's really important to start thinking of the sharing process from the beginning because you could trap yourself in contracts that prevent sharing. But um, are there other recommendations or situations when this should be something researchers should stop and think about? Absolutely. Um, the the terms of the contract and the terms of non-disclosure agreements or data use agreements are all very important. And I know a lot of times um, researchers are ready to get their uh, work underway and want and, and it can agree to some things that they might not have otherwise wanted to. And, and it can have unintended consequences for data sharing, sharing down the road. Um, oftentimes, our office fights back on export control terms when we, we see that we're not going to be receiving any export controlled data because we're a subcontractor or, or some other for some other reason. And we can get that term out of the agreement where that would allow for sharing uh, um, where it wouldn't otherwise. All right, and we had a question from the audience, which I think is for Sarah, which is, can, um, I think, and Carlos, please feel free to clarify this, can data be shared if participants are given pseudonames? And I think this was addressing uh, IRB protocols that say the data will only be shared with the research team. So um, if data sharing was not brokered in, can the data be shared if participants are given pseudonames? I personally would say no. And again, that would go back to what the participants were told in the informed consent document. Um, if it says that this information will not be shared, that needs to be honored. Um, if what we often see though in informed consent documents is language around what will happen to data. So your data may be shared in aggregate. Your data may be shared with other researchers. You will be given a pseudonym and this information will be shared broadly with our colleagues. And so there is, there is language that can be included in those informed consent documents that would allow for that. But I would, again, go back to what was approved in your IRB protocol. And then secondly, what did the informed consent document say? All right, so Carlos, if um, I got your question wrong or if you have follow-up questions, please let us know. So um, let's see. So I wanna reflect back a little bit on this whole process and not just um, in the workflow we've built. And I wanna say that while it's kind of a unique workflow and we're still working on it, I, I know I've been very pleasantly surprised, not just with how well it's worked, but how the library has been able to benefit from it too, because um, we end up with information on grant funding, which we can then plug into the data set and describe the data set with the grant funding, which then provides a direct link to the funding, to the research, to the research outcome, back to the paper, and it kind of completes the full cycle. And this is not something I anticipated when we started the process, um, and it, but it has been really beneficial, especially in showing um, researchers how we're able to link all that together. So um, processes like these, I think take a little while to get off the ground, but definitely show um, benefits beyond what we anticipated. So. All right, Carlos says he is working on a um, MAIS with a concentration in anthropology and we'll have, we'll be starting a project that will need to be approved by the IRB, which is why he was asking those questions. Now you know going in, Carlos, and you can ask your IRB too for help. So um, I think that concludes all of my known questions or my questions I had for the group. Um, do you, any of our panelists have questions for each other? or comments? You know, I was going to just say that one of the benefits that we're, our office gets from participating in this process is, is um, 
gaining awareness of what different types of research are going on at Iowa State. You know, we separate um, our cases as they come in kind of into domain areas. Um, I'm a chemical engineer, so I picked up, you know, when I first started uh, all the chemistry, material science, biochemistry related types of uh, disclosures. But even within that, you kind of end up with uh, a set of researchers that you do a lot of work with. And then the, the vast the rest of uh, the researchers in those departments are, are somewhat anonymous because you're not really interacting with them. And so this gives us a, a little bit of insight that even if the data set they're disclosing isn't of real commercial interest, it gives us a better insight into what types of research they're doing and you know, gives us opportunities maybe to, to interact with them in the future. So it's a great benefit from, for our office in, in that respect, so. Uh, we got a question, or we got a question and a comment from Mara, who says, "I'm joining you from Colorado State University, where I'm the data man management specialist at the library. This is an inspiring example of effective cross-campus collaboration and a great model for workflows. I'd love to see implemented at my institution. I was wondering if you review data management plans associated with grants as part of this process. So we don't currently review data management plans as part of the disclosure process." because that's part of the greater grant application. And I believe your offices are already included in that process in different levels. The library does provide data management plan um, review and guidance to help people comply with funder policies. Um, but we haven't integrated it into, dis into the disclosure process. And that's definitely an interesting idea. What's everyone's thoughts on that? I think they're kind of a hot potato <laughs> in some regards, uh, to be frank. Our office doesn't see them. Uh, they're not required as part of any of the applications for the research compliance aspects that our committees are looking at. They do go in through a different office that was also part of very early on the, the data sharing task force. Um, and that's OSPA, the Office of Sponsored Program Administration. And so the data management plans, as my understanding, are submitted through them. Um, but again, as far as their review of them, I, my knowledge is, to my knowledge, they are not reviewing them either. So they, it's, it's kind of this, no one's really claimed them yet as far as integrating them into this process either, as Megan has said. And I know we get ones where they say, we're going to work with IRB if this is approved. And so I think part of this is like the research pipeline isn't all in sync either. But for commercialization and security and export control and on the Ames lab end, I have no idea <laughs> how that works. So um, any thoughts? We, um, proposals run through my office. So we do um, get to see the data management plans, but like OSPA, we don't do a heavy review into them. Um, the ones where Ames Lab is the lead for proposals, we do have a template that we encourage people to use and we do reference data to share um, as well as submitting their um, accepted manuscripts for publications to us. Um, but as far as what's submitted with the actual full application of the proposal, we don't do a deep dive into. And Craig, have you ever seen a data management plan across your desk? Um, I don't know if I've seen one specific to data management. Uh, you know, we occasionally see IP management plans, uh, which data could be considered part of IP in that sense, but typically it's not uh, the, the true focus of the, the, the plan that we see. Um, and usually that's in response to, um, I mean, sometimes with response to federal federal proposals because uh, depending on the agency and you know the purpose for the funding, you know, there's there might be a commercialization focus on it, uh, but generally it's it's more in line with you know uh, in industry sponsors or commodity sponsors and you know how they want to have the data shared or not shared. So, um, but it, it's not very typical for us. Yeah, and tying back to what Sarah said with it going through OSPA, the Office of Sponsored Program research programs, I'm trying to remember the name of it. 
Um, they, I think they just make sure the data management plan is there, like it meets their paperwork requirement for filing a grant, but I don't know how, I, I similarly don't know how much they're reviewed. I know folks will reach out to me and actually we had one last week that they were like, we have five terabytes of data, can you take it? And I was like, no, that's a little bit more than we're built to take. And then we dug into it and it was actually, they only needed to share, they estimated about 150 gigabytes. We're like, okay, that's much more scalable, the scale we can help you like manage and share. Um, and so sometimes we get it at that stage. We've also had people go, hi, my grant was approved and data share was on it. Now what? And I'm like, oh, that's a surprise because we've never talked to you before. <laughs> so I know it might be useful to have it be better integrated, but um, the whole grant workflow, like how to get that approved is pretty um, complicated last time I looked into it. But really good question, Mara. Thank you for that. Brooke, did you have comments? Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, if we, uh, I, I saw the, the chat comment. I was going to say, if it was done at the proposal stage, there just is not time with, uh, with reviewing. But later in the research life cycle, it's something that our IT security has wanted us to consider doing in the past. Um, we right now it's it's all up to uh staffing and resources and we we just don't do that at this point in time yeah the other problem i think was ospo was using um tools that were pretty closed so there was no way for us to get smart sheet to talk with them when i looked into this too so that was another problem because those are highly restricted um environments and smart sheet um is has a security layer, but it has um, like some hooks where we can hook it into other programs to do automated triggers. So, and there is no way to automate like a export to OSPA or from OSPA to us, so. All right, well, uh, we're five minutes till the top of the hour. And unless there are other questions, I think we're gonna wrap up and I wanna um, just, Thank everyone, especially our panelists from coming today, Sarah, Brooke, Craig, and Beth, you guys did a fantastic job and I know I learned a lot. Um, and I'm really looking forward to also getting the video recording of this out because I know I did get some emails from folks who weren't able to make it but were interested. So um, thank you all for coming and a short reminder that we have a topic for next month that is on a related topic. And Carlos, you might want to come because it's about anthropology data in particular. <laughs> so I hope to see you there and have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.